This episode of our podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage for your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1 855 385 4226 or visit their website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hey everyone, welcome again to the podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Page. Joining me tonight is Eric Camacho and Ian Pavelko. Get gentlemen, how are you doing? Hello, everybody. Bonsoir tout le monde. Obviously, I think the thing on everybody's mind right now, of course, with you, Eric, you're being in Florida, of course, is uh, Hurricane Dorian that's coming in. Uh, I'm sorry, what there's can a you... what? What's happening? There... <laughs> oh, no, it's not a tornado. It's a hurricane. You know, well, one of those things that blows a lot of air. That, that yeah. Un- of yeah. Well, yeah. hurricanes can spawn their own tornadoes. So there is yeah. that. That's scary. And water, and that's water spouts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how are things looking in your neck of the woods? Whew, brutal. I, I tell you what. Um, so our friend Raphael uh, Teslatino, he um, sort of, he, he actually put onto social media what I was thinking earlier tonight when I was driving around town trying to get supplies for, to ride out the storm. Um, which isn't projected to impact Florida until like Sunday, Monday of the Labor Day holiday. And uh, all you see is after gas station after gas station, just lines of people waiting to get gas uh, for their generators, for their cars, uh, you know, for whatever, for maybe sometimes our lawn equipment to start trimming back trees and stuff like that. Um, You know, so I, I feel bad for them because it's my first major storm now having an electric car. And I'm like, well, I'm set. I'm good there. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, there there is um, there's a mixture of panic in a lot of folks because there's so much uncertainty, and some of it is brought about by social media with people sort of, um, you know, this this uh, dramatization of what's actually going to happen because we really don't know. We're still kind of too far out. As we're taping the show on Thursday, uh, the four to five day forecast is very uncertain, so we don't know where the storm's going to hit. How we know it's going to be probably a, a strong uh, category three, category four hurricane. Uh, upon landfall, which is pretty significant. That's, I mean, that's something you don't mess around with. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of empty shelves here with no water, no Gatorade. Um, you know, people, uh, obviously aren't buying coconut water for some strange reason, but, (laughs) but yeah, we are, we are, um, you know, some people are, are professionals and they've been through a number of hurricanes and they know the routine. They know when to put their shutters up and when they get their supplies, they got their batteries or flashlights, their radios and so forth. Um, I'm going to run out the storm here in my apartment. Uh, I do have hurricane shutters uh, stored here, so we'll see when the complex decides to uh, get them all up. I mean, I would think in the next 24 to 36 hours, we should know uh, where the storm's projected to go. Um, Early indications are it's going to hit the Space Coast uh, near Melbourne, Cape Canaveral area up there. Um, So we'll see. Again, the storm is not a pinpoint. It's actually a broad area. So even if you're not in the core of the storm, uh, you can still see tropical storm conditions uh, for sometimes well over a hundred and some odd miles away from the center. Uh, so we'll see. It's, it's, um, it's, I'm not focusing on it yet. It's cause it's not really there. It's just constant coverage. Like anything else, when you hear it all the time in the news, you sort of want to take a breather and say, you know, let's just put some music on for a change and not hear constant, uh, news. But I think as it gets closer, as the forecast becomes more pronounced and more, uh, more confirmed, and then I think it's really going to start setting in for some people. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, you know, I appreciate you guys. I know, uh, Trevor, you, you tweeted out uh, a, a non-realistic image of a hurricane that's hitting Florida. Um, but we appreciate everyone's thoughts. Uh, again, if you're listening to the show, if it's something that brings you entertainment and you're able to kind of distract yourself during the storm, uh, by all means do that. We, uh, we download some podcasts, save them on your phones. So if you don't have an internet, at least you can listen to the show for a bit. Yeah, I was thinking about this last uh, week. I mean, because, you know, all the news starting and stuff, I thought, you know, uh, I kind of worry about, I mean, that's not something, I mean, we worry about things like snowstorms occasionally up here, yeah. but we don't have like things like hurricanes and stuff. So I, obviously I've never been through it, but it's something that I've been thinking about, which surprised me that uh, kind of segues into our first thing that we're going to talk about here real quick is, uh, um, I was surprised that nobody hopped on Twitter and just asked Elon um, what their situation was but the superchargers, because in the past, they have been known to uh, do two things. One, make uh, supercharging free for people that were affected by this and wanted to get away. And second of all, people that had smaller batteries, say a 40 kilowatt or the 60 kilowatt hour batteries, uh, they did a software unlock for the cars that had, you know, software lock batteries. So... I thought, why not? I sent out a tweet today and I asked Elon, will you be unlocking free supercharging and extra range for those who need it to get the safety of Hurricane Dorian? And Elon said yes. 
So there you go. If you're in the uh, southern parts of uh, Florida and you might be affected, you can be uh, rest assured that uh, Tesla will um, pull out, make some kind of blog post or Twitter post or something to that effect, um, to open that up. So they're doing the right thing, which is which is awesome. So I'm glad to see that. So um, yeah, for and those and of you who might be affected. when that happens, uh, a lot of the toll roads in the state, uh, they basically uh, say, make them toll free so people can get out as fast as possible without having to deal with stoppages and traffic jams and things like that what's a what's a great lesson for a storm like this is again we don't know the the actual path of the storm but we learned from uh irma um a couple years ago is that when you have a storm coming up from the south and there's a lot of uncertainty in the forecast path um if you think if you're gonna i'm just gonna go over to the west coast or i'm just gonna go north to south and you don't know where the storm is going to go yet. So even mm-hmm. in a state like Florida, you can go north and south as much as you want. Sometimes you're going to end up in the exact same predicament uh, you would have been in had you stayed home, but now you're somewhere else. You don't have the comfort of your own surroundings. So um, ideally, like anything else, we always recommend heat caution, listen to your local authorities, listen to the National Hurricane Center and their alerts, um, You know, just stay vigilant and stay attentive. But uh, right now, as we're taping, this is not the time to panic. Uh, we have ample time to get ready. But the good thing about hurricanes, if there is anything good to say about them, is that if we do have time to prepare, and that's most important. That's awesome. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. So uh, for those of you who have Teslas, uh, you'll be in the in a good position should you need to evacuate for whatever reason. Tesla's going to do the right thing. So I'm just going to assume from now on that if this kind of thing happens again, Tesla will do the right thing and just keep doing this. So bravo for Tesla and Elon mm-hmm. for doing the right thing for everybody. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, let's get into some other news today. Something broke a little earlier this week. Uh, Transport Canada. Now, we're going to talk for Canadians here a little bit. So for those of you who uh, who, who are not aware of this, um, Tesla Canada does not allow us Canadians to import U.S. Uh, Teslas. They block us. Now, uh, there's, there's a link, and I'll put it in the show description. You guys can check it out. Um, the reason ostensibly has been because in Canada we have a vehicle immobilizer law, so we, that's why we can't do things like summon from the key fob. I mean, there, there are some laws, and I don't know all the intricacies and so on and so forth, but uh, that was one of the blocking points that Tesla said, that they were not prepared to do any kind of retrofits to these cars to get them up to compliance. Some other people have made things like, uh, they've said things like, oh, well, we have a law that says the uh, seatbelt buttons must be red. Well, maybe at one time, but I tell you, the mo- my Model X does not have black, or has red uh, does not have red buttons. Sorry, it has black buttons. So that's kind of out the window. I don't think they really pay attention to that. Other people will say things like, um, oh, uh, they need uh, French and, and, and English uh, uh, labels. And that's true for a car that's imported to Canada in the sense that it would be sold in Canada as a new vehicle. That's a requirement, but I don't think it's a requirement for used cars in that sense. But anyways, to make a long story short, I noticed on the Transport Canada website, because I was poking around, that there's been a change, and uh, I will bring up the page here so you guys can take a look at it. All right. Now, they put a disclaimer here. It says, the following information is subject to change without notice. Transport Canada and Registrar of Imported Vehicles uh, does not guarantee its accuracy. This is as of August 23rd. They now state that 2017 to 2020 Model 3s, something just fell down on the ground. Anyways, uh, 2017 to 2020 Model 3s are now admissible. There's a column here that says inadmissible. So if it was inadmissible, it would be in that list. Now it is listed as admissible. Same thing with 2012, same thing with 2012 to 2020 Model S's and uh, for Model X's as well. There's a little disclaimer at the bottom. So if you just go to the explanation section, they're talking about the EIS, which is the the, um, electronic immobilizer system. So anyways, that is the part that's uh, that's always been the bone of contention, I believe, with Tesla. So anyways, um, I think, to make a long story short, it looks like Tesla might be prepared to actually do the retrofits. Um, but I'm not going to say to everybody, it's, uh, you know, you have carte blanche here to go and start importing cars. I would caution you, if you're looking at uh, importing a U.S. Tesla and you want to do now, it looks like you will be able to. But I would check with Tesla first. And the other thing with Tesla, you have to remember, uh, just like anything else, communications is not always the best. So if you talk to a service technician or somebody at a desk, they may not already have been informed. They may not have an internal note yet. So this is probably at the corporate level, but it may not have been communicated all the way down to the service personnel that are responsible for this kind of stuff. So if you're looking at doing something like this, I would advise you, please check with Tesla first. 
call Transport Canada or the RIV uh, people that are responsible for this stuff and just get the straight dope on this. But this is a significant change because up until recently, we have been landlocked. There, there was no way for us to import uh, U.S. cars into Canada because, uh, let's face it, there's a lot of us up here who would like to be able to do that because there are some really good deals down in the U.S. And um, because there's more inventory to choose from, it generally means that the prices can be lower up until now, you know. We, were, we always had to buy a Canadian uh, Tesla. So until we get final confirmation from Tesla, I would just assume that, uh, you know, things are probably still in play at this point. So anyways, good news for those of you who want to um, get some Teslas into Canada from, you know, the U.S. or abroad or something like that. So anyways, some good news. Any thoughts on this, guys? I mean, it's, I mean, God, this has been going on for forever. And this is one of the things, like, if you go look at uh, uh, BMW, for example, there's literally... Uh, and they have a list of cars, by the way. You can look at the admissible cars. Um, there is no cars. Uh, let me just pick up BMW here. Boop. BMW, 2004 to 2019. All models. Doesn't matter what you buy. <laughs> All admissible. Let me uh, let me jump in on that, though. Uh, Please do. BMW is an interesting case because I don't even think it was around 10 years ago. They were doing the same thing. They were trying to block... Uh, the import of their cars, and I think there was some sort of a court case against them. I don't know if it was a class action, sort of exactly what what the um, the case was, but they went after them. A group of people trying to import the cars and said, "Look, you know, they're the way they were trying to stem it is like, oh well, you know, you're going to have to do procedure X Y Z to make the car legal here, and you're going to have to bring it to a W dealer, and it they were going to charge like three thousand dollars to bring the car into the compliance, and it was outrageous. It was for nothing, just to activate the daytime running. Yeah, well, it it would not su- listen. It would not surprise yeah. me that Tesla would pull something like that either, too. So. So just forewarned, you know. Well, right. That's we don't know, right? We don't we don't know exactly what they're gonna what they're gonna do. The idea that the immobilizer was the problem to me is ridiculous. Like what immobilizer? There's no engine in the car. It's all software. I mean, you know, you just you know, like code a line, and the car is well. Immob- yes and no. You have to keep in mind. I mean, their uh, standard range Model Three doesn't even have the home link, and there's hardware involved with that. So there's possibility there might be a module that's not actually installed on the cars. I, I just I'm looking at it from a purely mechanical like I, Ice Age mentality here, where no, I mean, understand. a immobilizer is an anti theft device. It's something to prevent the yeah. engine from starting. And I mean, in this case, that's just access. I mean, it's just you know, can you can you turn the car on or not? So I, I don't see how that would be a piece of missing hardware. It's just unimaginable to me. <laughs> anyway, well, it's, it's fantastic news. I'm thrilled about this. I mean, uh, myself and many many other people have been wondering. You know, like our angle in Quebec in particular, if I can be selfish for a moment, is like Elon's thing is like, look, we need to change the world to sustainable transport and sustainable en- energy as as much as possible. If there are used Teslas floating around anywhere in North America, the place they're going to do the most good on average is here because we've got, you know, virtually 100% renewable energy across the province. So every Tesla you import here is is going to have a massive effect on reducing CO2. So that's kind of my angle on it. Um, I mean, there's, I'm sure, all sorts of other people who are going to be happy in other provinces and yay. The only thing that does sort of affect, and I, I do feel for a lot of the Tesla owners who have cars up here, and it, to a great degree, I'm one of them now, uh, is that I think it is going to slightly lower the value of the cars that are here. That's typically what happens when a car becomes available for import from the U.S. into Canada. But I mean, you know, if it if it levels the playing field and it means that anybody can get whichever car they want from either country, yay, you know, like the more the merrier. I mean, something that jumps out at me with this entire uh, story, which is, again, a a lot of good news for um, the provinces in Canada. But if you, for example, are in uh, Washington state and you're looking for a used car and you happen to see one, say, on the East Coast in the U.S., well, the transport fees can be up to two thousand dollars to transport that car from one area of the country to the other. So when I maybe don't know uh, concretely is what would then be the uh, transportation charges to bring that vehicle from the U.S. across the border into Canada. So it's one thing to allow permission to do so, but then what's the cost to do that? And that may determine, Ian, your point now, which is a spot. It was a great point to make is what will that do to the value of the cars that are already there? I think if you're sort of factoring in the transportation costs, maybe the value changes a little bit less than what you think it might otherwise without that factored in. Because again, it's up to 2000 in the US to transport from one side of the country to the other. My thinking is that, and maybe with the Canadian conversion, it's going to be even much higher than that to go from one. Again, depends where. If you're in Vancouver or you're British Columbia and you want to get a car from Seattle, maybe it's not as significant. No, but, no, if that's not based, but if the car is based in Illinois, 
you know, that might be a little bit different, but that, that's to be seen. Uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, my friend Rob, um, who uh, lives not too far, um, he bought a BMW i3, uh, a used one, uh, and he bought it, I think it was in Austin, Texas. So he flew down one way, and mm-hmm. he drove it all the way home, and... <laughs> That's a long trip in an I-3, man. It took him a lot longer. He says, oh, I'll do it in 24 hours. No, it was not 24 hours. It took him a long time because the charging is slow. And uh, why is this acting up funny here? Did, did, um, did it have a range extender? Yeah, he had the range extender. And then he had problems with um, with with uh, with the battery. He wasn't taking him far enough. Uh, anyways, make a long story short, I think it ended up being a 34 or 35-hour trip. Anyways, it was, it was interesting to hear anyways, but... Well, you know, then, for, for, for some of us who want to go and buy a car and then, you know, take it cross country, it's certainly possible. It's a lot easier yeah. on a Tesla, that's for sure. So, I mean, why not use that as an excuse to actually and do that? But if you buy, you know, any of the older Model S's or Model X's with grandfathered supercharging, it's free. So all of a sudden that becomes the attractive way to do it. Yeah. Um, that's certainly what I was. I almost bought a Volt in Texas, as a matter of fact, before I got the one up here in Vermont, the one we have now, Titanium Man. That was that's what I was going to do. It's fly down one way ticket. You know, it's going to cost me seven hundred bucks, and then you know whatever it was, a couple hundred bucks in gas to drive it back and see a little bit of the center of the country at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So, anyways, all good news. Um, you know, for people that are looking to do that, I know at one point when I was looking at CPOs, I was like, why can't we import a bloody Tesla? I mean, some good deals down in the U.S., but you know, yeah. we were landlocked. So, anyways. Good. A C3PO? A C3PO, that's right. All right. All right, some of the other news that's happening this week. Well, it, it turns out that uh, we got some spy shots, and I know there were some people on Twitter that were saying, no, no, they're not spy shots, they're leaked. Let me tell you for a fact that Tesla does not leak images from inside their factories. That is a big no-no. Anyways, the first spotted what looks like to be a body in white <clears throat> on the Tesla Gigafactory 3, that's the one in China and Shanghai, uh, was leaked out to the internet. And uh, I got some shots here. I'll just put up you guys can see. These are rough shots. Everything out of, out, of, out of China seems to be pretty low res. I don't know if that's the firewall or they're taking pictures with potatoes. But, hey, it is what it is. So here is a Model 3. I don't know what the other one is in the background there. But, this is uh, great audio, by the way, for our podcast listeners. <laughs> exactly. Please I'm subscribe just, to the YouTube channel if you want to see the pictures. I'm just every time I want to point that out, I'm like, hey, <laughs> take a look at this. And the person's in the car going, I can't look at it. I'm driving my car. Well, listen, folks, we make two versions available. We put an audio version of the podcast out, and we also post the video version on our YouTube channel. So subscribe to both and watch both. We need we need police sketch artists in everyone's car. Ex- exactly. Like Sorry about that. Anyway, so it's definitely a Model 3 on a production line. It's a body in white, which is unpainted. Now, I don't believe for a second here that we're talking about cars that are actually in production or this one was necessarily built there. I think what they did is they shipped parts over there and they just threw one, maybe just you know, maybe just the body white and threw it on there. And what they're doing at this point is that they're starting to validate the processes at the factory. They are not making cars yet. I don't think so. It's too early. Although they did say that pilot production could begin as early as September. So we're not that far away. But these pictures, certainly the way I look at them and I've scrutinized them quite closely, it looks like they're um, they're starting to get things lined up. Like when you put a car on a body in white like that on a track and, you know, you're taking it station to station, you're trying to make sure that all the mechanisms and the sensors and stuff that makes those carts move are, are stopping and starting. So anyways, they're in the preliminary stages of getting the production line going. So um, I think it's pretty exciting. I mean, to have the first Chinese-made uh, Tesla Model 3 is going to be pretty exciting. So this factory is certainly moving along a lot faster than a lot of us ex- expected, especially the shorties. My God. <laughs> it's a swamp. It's a swamp. There's nothing there. Ah, I got news for you, folks. It's not a swamp. I don't know who has. It had to be Earl. I mean, Earl's you know on top. Earl's the of best. The, the short burn list, but um, <laughs> it was like there was a whole. And I, I I hope it was him. If not, I apologize to whoever posted. Or I thought it was brilliant. It was like all the short excuses as to what's wrong or impl- Earl does that, yeah. Implausible about the the China factory, and it was like okay, yeah, it's swamp. No, that's it's just a hull. You know, like no, it's a box. No, there's nothing inside it. Oh, okay, yeah, there's actually production equipment, but 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 they're going too fast now, so the cars aren't going to be built properly. That was the last one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they they always sure. make stuff up. Is they always make stuff up? As we go. are, it's, we are in this 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 odd era of misinformation, false uh, uh, information, lies, you know that sort of thing. And 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 ideally, you know, when when someone says, "I'm going to present you this fact," and government goes, "The hell with your facts. That's not what's going on." Like you can deny it all you want to, 
we we have actual ways of proving what we're saying. Um, so th this is, I, I think, one of the greatest accomplishments uh, we've seen this year from Tesla uh, and the team that's in China between the construct. First of all, the, the, sh the sheer speed in which that building was constructed, how fast it was essentially approved for occupancy uh, with their license. And now that they're actually starting to get sort of sort of the piecemeal um, moving components in there. And they're, okay, let's now see how this stuff all works out. Um, I mean, we talked in our last episode um, last week that. You know, they could very well see this up and running in four to five weeks, which is like the end of September, um, which is amazing when you think about it. When they broke ground this year, January 7th, like, like it's crazy that they've done it this quickly and they could start producing cars in Q4. Like what? Like amazing. It, it, it astounds yeah. me that I don't know what it is. Why can't they move this fast in North America to get stuff done? It's, well, it's, it's astonishing. <laughs> yep, yeah, but it's astonishing to see how yeah. fast they can make. I mean, stuff. one 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 of it is labor laws. Just gonna, yeah. just gonna well, throw that out there. One. Sure, I, I get that. Unions. Oh, by the way, I was going to mention to the. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, there is a fantastic documentary on Netflix that I just watched, and I tweeted it out the other day. It's yep. called American Factory. Watch it. It will really open your eyes to see the difference of a Chinese and American culture trying to work together and really seeing it from both sides. It's one, uh, of the, it's, it's, it's one of the first documentaries produced by Michelle and Barack Obama. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That's their oh. production. Oh, yeah. wow. Let me understand this. The premise of this show is the differences between North American and Chinese manufacturing culture. I live this every day. <laughs> 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 I don't it reminds me of the movie, you know, Gung Ho, we keep talking yeah. about. It's like Gung Ho. It's just like, you know, life imitating art. It's yeah. singing yeah. thousand cars. Yes. No. No, it's I, crazy. Uh, so watch the documentary. Highly, highly recommended. All right. Uh, well, this just broke yesterday. Tesla insurance is now available. So this is the Tesla branded insurance. It's available in California now, of course, because there's a whole bunch of different states. It's going to spread eventually. Unfortunately, because I'm not in California, all I can do is bring up the website. And it doesn't say much. Um, <laughs> get a quote. So if I try and getting a quote here, let's see what it does. It's going to revert while, me to the Canadian while, site. While, Coming while, soon. While you're doing uh, that, um, there was a period of time and Tesla tweeted this out. They actually shut the content down for a while. They did. Um, because there were there were some people who were getting quotes. Um, I think Alex Petra and some others were getting quotes. And they were getting really high quotes, uh, yes. like 20, 30% more than what they're already paying through their current insurance company. Yeah. Uh, so Tesla said, hold on, we're going to, we're going to do the math. Fix the algorithm. That's what they said. Right. They had to fix that. Uh, and then they relaunched it. So, uh, it is going to eventually grow in number, but, uh, they're keeping it local. Like they do a lot yeah, of things. So, yeah. Tesla insurance is available in California. We'll notify when it's available in my area. So right now it's not, I mean, it must be doing some geo geolocation or whatever, but it's not showing me anything at this time. So anyways, uh, listen, if, uh, viewers know what their quotes are, uh, you know, how it compares, uh, give us apples to oranges. I mean, send us an email or uh, fire something on our Twitter account. We'd be curious to see what the rates are. I've seen lots of people say, oh, it's this much, this much, but we haven't even seen any comparisons. I, I want to see, you know, what's your, what's your deductible, um, all these, these types of things. So I'm hoping at the end of the day that Tesla is taking into account things like safety and all the other features. I think that's one of the reasons why they started this whole thing too. But uh, anyways, congratulations for Tesla for doing that. I mean, I mm -hmm. love the shorties. They said, no, it's impossible. It's impossible. And, and now that they've actually released it, now they're changing their tune. And as usual, they're saying, no, no, it's uh, it, 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 it's fake. It's a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what's amazing to me? The shorties are over. Yeah. forever they they have yet to get anything right on what tesla's doing and i'm like can we you just want yeah. you guys want to really keep going you're you're like you're like yeah, the, they never get anything right you're like you're like the cleveland browns from years ago when they just couldn't <laughs> win a game like you're consistently just, you're, proven I mean, wrong hey you know what i applaud the effort i will tell you that much oh huge a for effort but i i think it's time to hang it up seriously yeah yeah, yeah. All right, next piece of news. Uh, this one comes courtesy of Autoblog. NHTSA, the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Advisory Administration, I should say. You know, those letters always interchange. Well, hallelujah, the, the angels are singing because this is one of the things that people have been talking about for like the longest time. When can we get rid of bloody mirrors on cars? Well, it looks like they finally announced that they are going to start testing cars without mirrors looking at technology now um there's some parts of europe and japan that this is legal to do um i think the audi e-tron available in germany 
if I uh, if I remember correctly, is available without mirrors. They have little internal, uh, little cameras on the outside and little screens on the inside. So anyways, uh, NHTSA said that they're actually working uh, in an alliance since 2014 with General Motors, Volkswagen, uh, Toyota Motors and others, along with Tesla. Uh, they petitioned NHTSA to use a rear camera based or side vision systems. So anyways, um, they said in a report that, that last year that they were still studying the issue. This is something I've been following for some time. They've been studying this issue a little bit longer than that. Anyways, uh, so it turns out that they're going to start um, uh, testing soon. Now, keep in mind, these laws take forever. These laws uh, move at glacial paces. So don't expect anything to happen overnight. I do know that Tesla would love to get rid of mirrors. They would drop them like a hot potato if they could. I mean... Every prototype other than the Model 3 has always been shown without mirrors. <laughs> they hate mirrors. Let's face it, with an EV, right? You want to get rid of things that, that cause drag. And um, I think Elon had said at one time, or one of the designers, I think it's anywhere from 2 to 3% uh, yeah. mirrors. Yeah, that would not surprise right. me. Yeah. So... Uh, let's see here. They said, uh, Tesla said in October that it made, uh, eight external cameras on the Model S and Model 3 cars active, providing a 360 degree visualization of surrounding cars. Um, I think there's some leeway in here that Tesla could do some kind of melding technology to help with this. Um, as a side note, I'll just mention right now, there is a video that's circulating, um, the latest firmware, well, actually, it's a beta firmware. I think it's 32.7, if I remember correctly. Don't quote me on that. Um, but there is a visualization uh, on the Model 3 because you can actually touch the um, the autopilot where it shows you the car. You can actually move it around in 3D space. So there's some funny stuff going on there. I don't know what it, it's, if it's important of um, changes that are coming as far as visualization or being able to do something maybe with 360-degree camera views. That is a feature I would love to have on, on Teslas in general because parking is a, is a brute on these cars sometimes. People are curbing the wheels all the time. People do. So, yeah. So having a 360-degree view would be very welcome. Um, what is it? I saw a video the other day. I think it was um, the brand-new SUV by, I think it's called the Ursus. That's the Lamborghini one. It has a really cool 360-degree view thing. You can pull it up on the screen. Even when you're driving forward, it melds uh, the surroundings in this really cool um, surround view thing. So T Tesla can do this. It's just, it's just a matter of whether it's on their priority list or something. So any thoughts, guys? I think this is pretty exciting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, as soon as that was announced, I, I hopped right on and responded back on Twitter and said, you know, like, I really hope that there's some way they could integrate this as a retrofit kit. I know there's a lot of us, based on the responses I got, that would be interested in doing so. I think a lot of it hinges on what is going to be the interior display uh, mm -hmm. method, you know, like, in order to get it to pass, I think, you know, you're going to have to go with driver's instincts to look at those corners of the door. So it's going to have to be, you know, where those little panels are right in the, the forward corner of the driver and passenger window would be one location or something in, in you know, in the door card itself. But it's going to have to be something in that region. So if it's in that little triangular panel where, um, you know, in those little grills, if they, if you can somehow take that out and just plug something else in. If it's a plug and play conversion, that should be relatively easy. The door card, well, now you're getting into something much pricier. Yeah. I mean, everything's possible, but I don't know if I would want to spend that much money. I don't think personally that Tesla would make anything officially retrofittable because, you know, there's, I'm sure there's some cabling involved and so on and so forth that they don't want to get into. I think it's something they would eventually put into production. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like the law now that requires all cars to have backup cameras. I think that came into effect as of May of last year. I'm pretty sure, um, where cars have to have backup cameras. Um, that's not retrofitable by manufacturers because they just don't have the wiring harnesses for it. It doesn't mean you can't buy a third-party kit. There are third-party kits for that type of thing you can do. This mirror thing, who knows? Uh, what is it? Faraday Future on the FF91. Remember they had, when they showed that they had mirrors on the car, but they could be removed and replaced with cameras and, of course, screens inside the car. So those guys were thinking ahead. Now, whether they actually bring the car to market, it's a different animal altogether. I'll... Um, but as far as Tesla's concerned, um, no, I don't think so. It, it, you know, again, it's it's resources. It's what they can do today. It doesn't mean that they can't do it to cars in the future because they're always improving the vehicles. So I think if, if they were going to do it, it's something that they would put into production eventually once they get around to it. But I don't think this is going to be a law thing for at least two years. No, yeah. I, also, I also think would be a really awesome solution sort of having a two-way mirror. Uh, so that in the event the technology ever failed, if you're, if the camera doesn't work anymore or there's some kind of obstruction or the electrical wiring goes haywire, there's still an actual mirror there. And then the drivers in the vehicle could actually still 
uh, use it. Uh, I think I think to completely take the glass away, uh, to take away the mirror is actually a bad idea. Um, <laughs> because I mean, look, we we're used to now our portable devices. I mean, our cell phones go wonky, uh, and they're and we're coming out with new phones every bloody year. So um, so we can we can certainly say that technology is vastly improved to what it was, especially in automotive technology, to what it was you know five, ten, twenty years ago. But it doesn't mean that it's not infallible. Uh, something can still go wrong. Uh, and to that end, I think you want to have some safety measures still standard, but improve, but if you can have a, uh, basically have the mirror as a housing for a camera and that way there's still a rear view mirror on there, I think it's actually a, a better idea, but that's just my two cents. <laughs> so if there's any designers out there, you got some great ideas, Hey, put them out on the internet. You never know what we could come up with. All right, moving on to, uh, let's see here, what's going to be our last article of the show before we get into viewer and listener questions, which is always an exciting part of the show. Apologize we haven't done it for the last couple of weeks, but, you know, we've been a little bit busy. Ian and I got some things going on last week, and okay. hey, it is what it is. All right. Um, Bargersville? Bargersville? How would you pronounce that? Bargersville is how I read it. Yeah. yeah? I, Bargersville? I, I, I dropped that one onto the subject list. I thought this was a fascinating story. The town of Bargersville, Indiana has bought themselves a Model 3 as a police car. Yep. And uh, for those of you that are, are watching, uh, if Trev drops the image in, you'll see I, I it. I have it right here. Looking. Yeah, it's black with a little bit of a blue inlay with the, the police logos on the doors. I think it looks fantastic. They've got the lights up in the um, up where the visors yeah. are facing the front. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's all stealth lighting. It's got LEDs basically uh, in the top of the windshield, um, in the re uh, top of the rear glass. Um, they've got some more uh, in the license plate frame. It's a really slick conversion. And um, I read the whole article, and I, I was fascinated by it. What's interesting is it's really a cost-driven thing, and they make a really strong case for it. The police chief there, Todd Bertram, said that um, you know normally when they look at trying, they, they're really on a cost-cutting measure thing. Apparently, the town's growing like crazy. You know, they're they're bill for patrolling and adding officers and everything the staffs were going up so the town asked them like where can you cut costs so they said well let's look at you know what the patrol cars are right now they have a fleet of 12 dodge chargers and it's costing them something like about seven thousand two hundred dollars a year just for the fuel and then add to that the maintenance and everything all else when they did the um, cost uh, analysis on um, a model 3 sr plus they came in at something like just sixteen hundred dollars for the electricity versus seventy two hundred for the gas. So can, even though there's about a nine thousand dollar difference in price, I think they're paying thirty three thousand dollars for the chargers, which is cheap for a police car when you think about it. Um, they're, they're quoting forty two thousand for the Model Three SR the way they want it, uh, but in, in something like less than two years, they're going to get their money back. And if they go on a five year lifespan, they're actually going to save twenty four percent over what it would cost them to run the charger. So something like a $16,000 savings per car to the town, which I thought was amazing. And he said, normally when we do this sort of thing, when we've looked at cheaper cars, we really have to give up, you know, performance. Uh, but he says, this car actually performs better than our police chargers. So I'll be very curious to see how that goes and if more towns adopt them. I've always thought that uh, electric cars, especially with Teslas, would make awesome um, police vehicles. Pers well... Even pursuit, patrol vehicles for sure, within town. It, it, it's perfect uh, for that kind of thing. What always interests me with uh, with police vehicles, of course, and there's no mention of on here, is what is the cost and how much customization have they done? Because if you look at purpose-built police vehicles, these are not just street cars. I mean, these are purpose... I mean, it doesn't matter. If, it, if you buy a Charger or what was the old, the old Crown Vix that yeah. everybody used around here, um, th those were... I mean, they had, uh, with the Fords, they had SHO engines in them. Uh, these were pretty hopped up cars. And of course, they didn't have regular back seats and they had, you know, the gun racks in them and the communications. So, uh, you know... Those cars, I'm sure they can add up very quickly. These are not, you know, your, your standard $30,000 car that they're buying. So how much conversion are they doing with this? Yeah, we saw the lights and stuff, but I, I want to know how much did they put inside this car? Um, just out of curiosity, just to compare. But I think it, it, I think it points in the right direction that, um, you know, some of these police departments can do some significant savings. So if these guys are doing it, um, I think something like this, the word spreads, right, in these communities. Um, there was, what was it, last year or the year before, uh, Los Angeles uh, bought some Model S's, uh, Los Angeles Police Department. Now, I don't know where they stand with that and what kind of testing they're still doing with that, um, but they bought some Model S's and they were testing them, and I think there was one or two other jurisdictions that had them too, but the names kind of failed me at this point. So I'm, um, 
I, I would love to see some of these cars in town. I think it would be pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I know we're going to get the goofy jokes. It's like, well, uh, what is going to happen? You run out of charge while you're, you know, like you're chasing your perp, man. I mean, but come on, the car's got 240 miles of range. And a cop car, for the most part, spends most of its life just sitting idling. At least this doesn't do that. I mean, it's... Most by the coffee shops. Yeah. Like they were saying um, in the article, it actually states that most of the patrol routes are somewhere around 80 to 120 miles. So, you know... Pff, peanuts. Exactly. For this car, it'll be cake. I really yeah. don't see a problem. Yeah. So bravo for these guys. Uh, if anybody else or any police or law, law enforcement, uh, you know, talk to your supervisors, man. This thing's going to save you some bucks if you uh, if you do the math. Um, I'd like to see more of this stuff. So congratulations to these guys. Mm-hmm. All right, let's take a break here for a moment, and uh, let's hear from our sponsor, and uh, we'll be right back and listen to some uh, and answer some uh, viewer and listener questions. Fine Lab has aligned protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. All right, so this is back to the time of the show where we like to answer listener and viewer questions. Now, for those of you who are asking where do we get these questions from, you need to follow us on Twitter. That's where we post the uh, form. It's a Google form. We usually do it the day before, but usually the day of the podcast so we can get some fresh questions and uh, so that we have an opportunity to answer them. So the first question comes from Aaron. He says, thoughts on comparing monthly costs of Model 3 to traditional cars. Context, people don't seem to realize that for most, it's comparable to a twenty or $30,000 vehicles. Yes, it's absolutely true. Um, there was a spreadsheet floating around, and I think I still have a link to it, and I will try and remember to put a link to it in the show podcast. It is a, um, it's your very own vehicle cost calculator, and you can compare it to as number of different cars you want, including Model 3, plug in your numbers, and it will come back and show you the total cost of ownership. We as owners know um, that these cars do cost less to operate than a traditional gas car, and this is, um, of course, something we talk about quite often. Uh, it is part of our discourse when we talk and when people have us questions um, you know, how far, how much, and how long. That's what everybody wants to know. And I always make a point of trying to talk to people, look, this car is going to save you money because there's very little to no maintenance on the car and your fuel is going to cost you a tenth of what you're paying now in gasoline generally on average. So it, it is a discourse as, 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 as owners, as ourselves, and as any of you who are buying Teslas um, uh, that... You have to get it into your mind. It's part of the discourse you have to have when people ask you questions. So um, it's tough to judge when you first got your car, like a week or two. You don't know exactly what your numbers are. But after six months to a year of ownership of the car, um, you know what your costs are. So you can do that math for yourself. But I'm going to try and remember to put a link here, and then you guys can look at a cost calculator that I have. Um, I didn't make it. I, I just found it on the Internet, and I'll just put a link out, and you guys can check it out yourself. Any questions? Um, any extra stuff? No? Move on? <laughs> All right, next question comes from Romy. He says, uh, he actually submitted two questions. First one, he says, is there a process to get some improvement requests to Tesla? For example, I'd like to know, would it make sense to help improve motor efficiency if a Tesla would allow dynamic activation of motors in the dual motor models? The answer is, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> um, well, yes to the first part. Uh, there's two ways we're doing it now. We have Bonnie on Twitter, who's gathering her own list. And yes. then there's the forum where there's an ongoing list of suggestions that owners can make. Yes. Unfortunately, there's no formal, this is the part I'm getting at, there's no mm-hmm. formal website on Tesla's site where you can say, send us your feedback in the sense of what features would you like to see? There's none of that stuff. I would like for yeah. them to see that. Now, I understand from a legal aspect, uh, you know, you can get in some problems and stuff like that because people can submit stuff and then they can come back and say, hey, I have a patent on that. Now I'm going to sue you, right? This this is, you know, kind of prior, prior art thing. So I understand a lot of companies don't actually take that kind of um, feedback because it could get them some hot water legally. Uh, but as Eric mentioned, uh, we, we do have something on the forum and uh, we are gathering that information. There are some back channels that we can get information through, including Bonnie herself, um, where we can submit that stuff. So, um, yeah, if you want to look at that type of thing, uh, hop onto the forum, Tesla Owners Online, and do a little search for uh, feedback, and uh, 
fill in your uh, desires and stuff. We're actually maintaining a list of, uh, of things. Now keep in mind that it's tough to keep these lists up to date because so much changes in the firmware all the time. So mm -hmm. people will ask uh, five or six pages back, they want this feature, we put it on the list, and then sometimes we forget to go back and update the list because that feature exists now. So <laughs> just one of those things. All right, uh, Romy asks a second question. Are any of you with the dual motor models experiencing a gradual decline in battery ranges? He says, I have a dual motor model non-performance that is only a year old and it shows 295 miles of rated range when charged at 100%. Many old, uh, other all-wheel drive owners are complaining of same. Um, Ian, you're the best guy to answer this because you have mm -hmm. a performance car. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, I noticed that, I want to say in late winter, early spring, there was a little bit of a tendency for that. And I did a couple of the um, the sort of um, the, the cell balancing exercises where you basically yes. charge the car to 100%, take it down to around 10, and then charge it back up to 90. And I did that on a few occasions, and that seemed to restore it. Um, lately, it's hard for me to say. I know when I look at my stats app, my little graph seems to be showing a slight declination. But I can't actually tell you what the rated range is in kilometers or miles because I always have it in percentage. And for the life of me, I never remember when I'm in the car. So uh, for Romy's benefit, uh, this week, I'll switch it to the, the actual um, mileage indication and I'll, I'll see what it does. But um, because I do a fair amount of long distance traveling with the car, I, I do a lot of range charges. Maybe that's actually helping it. I mean, people think it's take, stressing the battery out. But I mean, I follow, you know, the holy letter to the law here uh, or it's, it's basically charge it to 100 percent. When it gets 100 percent, like three minutes later, I'm in the car and, you know, I leave it parked overnight and yeah. then I take it all the way down and then bring it back up. So maybe that's helping. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I'm happy, happy to check. The one thing the one thing that's hard to gauge here is context right? Like we yeah. don't know how often this person's charging to hundred percent, what methodology they're using to charge their vehicle. Are they using superchargers, DCs, uh, home charging? Like we just don't know. So without that information, it's hard to really give a fair answer as to why it is. And if others are sort of saying like, Hey, I'm also getting, I mean, look, even on the show we've talked about that we've seen with software updates, sometimes the cars can do X mileage to 90%, all of a sudden, like two months later, you're not getting that charge anymore. Um, my battery is actually still at 100% of what it was when I got the car 16 months ago. So I haven't seen a degradation in my battery whatsoever. Um, and I primarily use um, destination chargers to plug in my car. Uh, and I've used supercharging a number of times, but I'm not using as a primary source of charging. So again, if you're if you're using superchargers often and you're using uh, you're charging your car to 100%, that can affect your battery in a very short period of time. Um, so without without any more information, it's hard to give a really good answer here. Um, but if there are other owners sort of saying the same thing, I think it'd be great to see it's like a um, a pooling of information. To like okay, amongst you who are complaining. How do you charge your car? Where do you plug in your car? What's your climate like? Are others in your area experience? That the more information, you know, maybe what VIN you have can matter. Um, you know, what your software is. There's just, just so much data yeah. points to really get a good answer. There's too many variables with this to yeah. say you are going to get. Like the thing is, is that Tesla advertises, you know, 300 miles um, on the Model Three, but but everybody's driving habits are different. Mm -hmm. Their charging habits are different. The software is different. They're always tweaking the algorithm. So I think too many people are getting their heads, I must get this at all times. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, old school people, people have been around for a little longer than some of the newer Model 3 owners know this for a fact, mm -hmm. right? It, you're going to get some degradation. And then, you know, the degradation usually happens at the start, most of it. And then after that, it's a slow decline. Listen, we th there are people that have been gathering this data for the last seven years. Th there are graphs available that show you mm -hmm. on a plot to show you exactly what the degradation is. So yeah. we have empirical data on this now. But y you got to get it past your head that you're not always going to get that range at all times because climate matters, driving style matters, charging matters. All There's so many variables. And the problem is, is that it's, and I think this is what it's getting down to, is that it's it's exacerbated with an EV because we don't have the same range as a gasoline car. And there's more factors in, in, um, involved with an EV that are more apparent that affect the range than a gasoline car. People always say to me, well, how much range do you lose in the winter? It doesn't matter because you lose range too on an electric, on, on a gasoline car. It's just mm -hmm. less noticeable to you, but it is still affected. So there's a mindset change that has to happen. So anyways... It is what it is, but and, you know the other thing too, and this is something I, I, I struggle with and how to explain to some folks, is that you're not generally driving from a hundred percent 
to zero percent. Never. No, you're, no, you're, no. you're stopping somewhere along the way if you're taking a long trip to plug in your car. Maybe you're running errands, you're, you're doing your daily routine. Well, you go home and plug in your car. Um, or maybe you don't have the convenience of charging. So at some point, you plan your day uh, to stop somewhere and charge your car at dinner or at the workplace or something like that. So there, there is this, there is this inherent fascination with the top number that people need to kind of get out of their head. You're not like my, look, my model three, I have a long range model three uh, with the H and inch arrows and the whole thing. My car is supposed to get 310. I have yet to in the year and a half that I've had my car ever come close to driving 300 miles. It, it just, it, it doesn't happen. Um, on a single charge. So yes, you ideally want to have the higher number, especially if you feel like, Hey, I bought X battery to have that range capacity. But again, no one really drives a car from completely full gas tank to empty, <laughs> you know, somewhere along oh. the way you stop and refill your car. <laughs> the same, the same applies. All right. Ian might be the outlier, but I mean, ideally, <laughs> um, right. But most people do that. So if this is a grave concern, you can always contact Tesla service. They, there is an option now just from your app. It takes seconds to make an appointment. And be like, look, I just, I just want to make sure my battery is healthy. And they can do a check for you. They can have a mobile service technician come to your location and check it out for you. Um, I, again, every car on the road today with Tesla is under warranty with the batteries. Every single one of them, uh, even those that have had a replacement, you know, at least that was under the warranty. So no one's paying for a new battery. So if you think you're having a problem, just contact Tesla service. It's not, it's not, um, it's not they a big deal. We'll thing. do a diagnostic for you if you ask them. Yeah. Not a big deal. Okay. All right. All right. Moving along. Next question comes from Neil. He says, Irish deliveries, um, have been delayed since at least July, not only model threes, but also S's and X's rumor is that a software issue I'm just saying at Tesla, um, is to blame, and they can't issue invoices. Have you heard of any other places with the same delays? Um, well, I can't say exactly what's going on with Ireland. I do know that Tesla has had, in other places in the company, some database issues that are unrelated um, to this. I, um, but I don't know how permeate uh, how uh, how much that's permeated the rest of the company. It's probably just minor, anyways. Um, I know that, and I don't know the situation in Ireland when it comes to invoicing. I know uh, we had problems. Remember Ian, when, we, when Ian picked up his car last year in September, um, he had major problems with his invoices because at the time, and I don't know what it is now, but at the time in Canada, all invoices for the Model 3s when they were starting to be delivered since about June onwards, of course, he picked his up, uh, what was it, September, right? Mm -hmm. September 27th. Yeah. Um, that all invoicing, paperwork, financing, all that stuff had to come out of California. If there was anything wrong with that paperwork, it had to go back to head office, it had to be bounced back to head office, and then it had to go through all the chain again. And it led to some significant delays. In the case with Ian's, it was uh, six hours. Now, of course, Irish people are having a little bit more problem than six hours. Yeah. Um, so I don't know exactly what the problem is. I did tweet to Elon and Tesla this week asking on all of your behalf what the heck is going on. And I have yet to receive a response on that, unfortunately. That, that's typical with Tesla. They don't always respond to everything. It's the luck of the draw. A lot of people seem to think that I've got Elon's ear on my phone, but that's not the case here. So um, so we're keeping an eye on that. We, uh, I should also mention um, we have a, a support section, if you will. <laughs> no. Um, on the forum, we have regional areas. So there's a section on there for Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, Ireland, England, all these different places. So if you're having issues on there, please go in the forum. Join if you're not uh, not a member. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Hop into those sections. Tell us what your experiences are. Relay us with communication so we have a better idea of what's going on. So it's the only way we can get this stuff kind of sorted out and uh, try to team up with everybody. Trying to get as much anecdotal information as possible to get a clear picture. I wish I had a better answer for you, Neil, but that's just kind of things um, the way they are at the moment. All right, next question comes from Jay. He says, uh, what PSI is best for the tires on your Model 3? I heard Elon say 39 PSI is a sweet spot. Uh, that's what I've been given, uh, what I've been targeting, unless I'm going on a longer trip, then I bump it up to 45. All right, Ian, do your thing. Well, now. <laughs> um, yes. That's, this is his wheelhouse. This yeah. is his wheelhouse. Oh, too easy. <laughs> it all depends. It depends. What is your your goal? I mean, you know, I think for ride comfort and out and out grip and performance, yeah, Jay's right on. Uh, thirty eight, thirty nine psi with the stock tires seems to work well. Oddly enough, in all three sizes. So whether your car's got the eighteen, the nineteen, or the twenties, that seems to be about the right zone 
um, for the car to operate. Uh, and if you, you just want to maximize ride comfort and, and performance, if you want range, well, then obviously higher is better with the upper limit being 45. Nobody yeah. recommends that. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, on a long trip, go 44 on Magneto on the track. Well, yeah, we got to be careful though. That was the yeah, was different. operating temperature. That's what it was up to. I, yes. I, 42. I ride 42 pretty much across the board on my 42. Yeah, 42 is nice in any of the OE sizes. I think it's a good compromise between range, comfort, everything else. I think that sort of freaks me out too about 45 is you start to see a little bit of wear in the center of the tread. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, if you're doing huge amount of mileage, like if you're a Tesla Tino case where the car is constantly doing like a thousand miles a week, yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe you want to get that extra range or whatever. But at the same token, be aware you're going to wear the center of the tire up probably a little bit more prematurely. I yeah. think he's already replaced this with tires. He did. He was on he the did. Yeah, yeah, he already yeah, has. He, yeah, he changed his tires just before he came to visit us. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jay, what you need to do is uh, get your butt down to Montreal and sit in on one of Ian's training classes like I had the opportunity last week. Man alive. The uh, material science that goes into tires and wheels. Oh, yeah. Trevor got the whole blow your mind. All the different categories of load index. And, yeah, we had a lot of fun. I was going to say, man, I wish all of you could have been there because this man <laughs> knows his stuff. The, the amount of stuff that I got out of that, I mean, he said, well, you can come down and sit on the thing. Yeah, I said, okay, fine. I came out of there. I'm like, holy mackerel. So, yeah. I figured you're either going to dig it or you're going to fall asleep. Those were No, no, I dug it, man, totally. <laughs> well, so let me ask you this, Ian, because I, I'm i one of those people who believes that, like, I keep my 42 PSI as often as I can. Mm -hmm. um, because of where I live in Florida, because of the, the heat, because of the conditions of the roads, and we've talked about uh, how our, our highways and whatnot are, uh, sort of made up with a, a mixing of uh, shell and asphalt and that sort of thing because of the temperature of the sun. Because, um, you know, we're, we're closer to the sun than everything else on Earth, uh, it seems. So, um, do, to me, that has an effect. I mean, I mean, one of the things, you know, one of the factors I would think you would tell, because I know Jason is a, is a fellow Canuck, that um, for if you live in a hot climate like we do, having anything at 42 PSI is better than 45, just because if you are driving, even if it's a shorter trip, on a hot day, that PSI could really go up there. Uh, and you're talking close near, if you're at 45 PSI when it's cold, mm -hmm. I would imagine if you're, if it's, if it's running, you're probably maybe 50, if not breaking 50. And isn't that sort of dangerous? Oh no, it's not dangerous at all. Um, okay. The, the thing is the tire is engineered for a certain maximum pressure cold. In the case of okay. all three sizes of OEM tire, for the Model 3, it's either 50 mm -hmm. or 51 PSI is the maximum okay. cold pressure. And okay. they're assuming under a worst case scenario, like you just described, in a really hot it's climate, cold. the tire could operate, you know, if it starts at 50 or 51, it's going to climb mm -hmm. well into the 50s, like 55, 56 at the upper case. So they're designed to operate like that. There's there's really no issue. It's not a safety problem okay. uh, at all. Uh, it's, it's a really good question. It's an interesting question. But yeah, you don't have to worry about it because they're designed to climb significantly. Now, to your point, Yes, the operating temperature will climb higher. There'll be a higher variable in a hot climb than there will be in cold. We actually have the opposite problem in Canada. When we get into like minus 20 uh, Celsius range, which is around the same as, you know, on the Fahrenheit scale, around down minus 18, minus 20 Fahrenheit, mm. you get to the point where the tire never warms up. Like if it's set to 42, it never crawls out of that space. It actually can lose pressure. Tire pressure warnings yeah. all day long. <laughs> Just because of the, the vast amount of, you know, aerodynamic cooling hitting the tread blocks, it actually sucks the heat out of the tire. So here in winter, I, I often run an extra two, three PSI just to make sure they operate in their, their happy space. But normally, you know, between let's call it ambient temperatures, you know, 70 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be in the 20 to, to 35 range Celsius, it's not significant enough. I wouldn't really alter my pressures that based on the exterior temperature that much, unless I was going to the track or doing something extreme. And then you're running a completely different set of pressures. It's all about performance. You're going to basically be, you know, like examining the tread surface and, you know, taking a pyrometer to the tires and doing all sorts of other stuff. So I, I wouldn't sweat it that much. I'm going to add one last thing though, just, just to nail this, you know, coffin shut is that especially with the, with Jay's Oh, car, we're not done. <laughs> With Jay's car, because it's a performance Model 3, and anybody else out there who has the original 20-inch um, setup, you're running a very, very low-profile tire. If you don't know it already, it's just it's a 235, 35, 20. There's like barely an inch of sidewall on that tire. And I, um, if you live in an area that has a lot of potholes or rough roads, be advised that you should keep the pressures up. I would never go less than 42, and I would almost tend towards 45. Got to bottom uh, out too fast. Yeah, because what happens is anything less 
is is the the tire is just going to compress instantaneously and it's going to transmit the shock to the wheel and you risk you know bending or, or cracking the wheel so high pressure mm -hmm. you know on these really low profile tires is your friend to try and avoid wheel damage which unfortunately i'm seeing way too many reported cases on on the 20 inch wheels okay well i said we weren't done yet because there's two more questions for you ian the first one comes from jeff he says, uh, by the way, thanks, Jay, for the, uh, for the question. Always yeah. appreciated. All right, moving along here. Uh, Jeff asks, the best summer tires for the Pennsylvania area, looking for longevity and safety, not worried about range. Thank you. Jeff, real short answer. Um, I can't get into that on Twitter because if you think I can make a mountain out of a molehill with tire pressures, you wouldn't believe how long I'd go on for discussing various <laughs> models of tires. This could go on ad nauseum. So um, truth be told, and this goes exactly back to what Eric was saying about, you know, um, charging and range and all these things. It's all about the variables. And with tires, there's an infinite number of variables. I, I, the parallel I always say is I like, learned that. Yeah. Well, it's like asking, you know, like, well, what's the best food? How do you, where do you even start? Indian. Like, is Indian? I mean, yeah, we, we'd all give, you know, different answers. And then it comes down to, well, you know, once you've determined the type, which exact restaurant do you prefer, you know? So with tires, really, I, I always tell everybody on Twitter the same thing. And it's not that I'm brushing you off. I love getting into these discussions, quite the opposite. But the place for that is on the forum. Go to Tesla Owners Online and look up replacement tire. Uh, the replacement tire thread, try to, if you're good enough, maybe we'll give you a little reminder to tag that at the end of the uh, the show. We'll put a link for it in the uh, the show notes. But there is a specific thread that I started exactly for this reason. And what I want all everybody out there to do is chime in with your experiences. Have you bought a replacement set of tires for your Model 3, whether they're summer, whether they're winter, whether they're all season? Um, as long as they're like in the original size, I don't want to get into the crazy, well, yeah, put 20 by 11s and man, and no, that we have an aftermarket thread where we're doing all sorts of gonzo things, but we have a thread going just for people wanting to know what's the best replacement tire for the car. And it all has to do on mileage. Do you want something that's comfortable? Do you want something that's out no performance? Does that have to be quiet that long, you know, long lasting is price a factor. So we talk about all those things and just, you know, spend 20, 30 minutes reading through the thread. It's fascinating. You get amazing input for from all sorts of owners who've already chimed in on it so i think that's the best place and uh, you know if you yeah, have forget a, about facebook go to the forum yes because we've got a running log you know the pages and pages and you can go back and you can search it and you can search <laughs> exactly it's fantastic. god i hate facebook <laughs> invest a little time on the forum and you know i i like to try and check in at least several times a week so you know and if anybody has a specific question in that any of the forums, you know, that has to do with wheels or tires, just, you know, make sure you tag me on it, you know, do the Beetlejuice thing, try it three times if you have to. Yep. And, uh, Matt Hungarian, just just tag that and uh, I will show up and I will uh, do my best to guide you. All right. Awesome. Thanks for that question, uh, Jeff. And uh, Ian, you're almost off the hook here. I got one more for you here. This one comes from Rob. It says, will the 18 inch Tesla winter tires, I'm assuming those are the 18 inch with the Soto Zeros, mm -hmm. um, will they fit? Uh, will they fit a Model 3 performance with the red calipers or do you need to buy larger rims? Well, if you're talking about the tire itself, there's no problem there. There's there's a number of 18-inch uh, wheels out there. Uh, I know a certain company that makes a few choices for this car. Um, but uh, yeah, not just us. There's there's a number of aftermarket companies that do make 18-inch wheels that are compatible with the performance upgrade brakes. That's not a problem whatsoever. So you could use the winter tire that uh, Tesla recommends. It's an excellent tire, the Pirelli uh, Winter Soto Zero. But uh, you also have the choice of really any 18-inch tire that you want to use. The only thing you cannot use is the factory um, Tesla 18-inch wheel. The aero package wheel, which is standard on the other models, does not fit the performance upgrade brakes. So that 18-inch package, as it's offered currently from Tesla, is not going to work for you. You can use the tire, but you need to find somebody else's wheel, and uh, then you can get it to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's see here. Next question comes from Eric Pierre. He says, there was a rumor surfing the web this week about the first Chinese built Model 3 being showcased today at the World Artificial Intelligence Conference, but no word since the original lead. Any updates? Um, no, there was uh, some other sites out there that were reporting that that was a rumor. Uh, that did not happen as far as I can tell. There was a tweet um, that was put out by Jay in Shanghai, and I have it here. I'll bring it up here. Whoop, right here. Uh, he claimed um, on here, uh, it says Tesla's booth at the Worldwide Conference says uh, showcasing made in China Tesla Model 3. I asked, was there a sign specifically saying this is a Model 3 made in China? And uh, no, and the response was no, there wasn't. Uh, just somebody probably jumping to conclusions. So um, I think 
you know, the information that was coming out, we talked about earlier, of course, with that body in white showing at the Chinese factory, of course, with uh, Elon being at the conference that this might happen. It did not happen. Um, I, again, it's too early for this kind of thing. So, um, no, it, it hasn't happened. So uh, unless there's something else that's going to be coming in the near future, I don't think that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's something that's uh, really happening. It's just a rumor. Okay, uh, let's see here. Le next question it comes from Dion. He says, do you think uh, it would be a great idea if Tesla would release a beta version for drivers to use the Tesla rideshare network to work out the bumps uh, when full self-driving becomes available? Uh, will they already have uh, the clientele? Uh, <laughs> it's too early. It's too early no. for FSD. No. I, um, I don't believe this is a good idea. I'll tell you why. Because even if FSD is allowed to be uh, put in some cars, and it might be market-specific when that happens, um, I think it's best to have this tested in a controlled environment. And when you have cars in the real world driving on highways and streets and so forth, that is not a good place to start testing it. So um, I think it's got to be a controlled environment where um, people can monitor the cars. They can actually put dummies in there. They can do something to make sure that no one's hurt, um, no pedestrians, no pets, no other car, like nothing. Like it's got to be a controlled environment if they're going to do it. If, if, if after multiple, multiple, multiple tests, um, you know, then it gets kind of the sign off on the software, then I think it's a good idea to start letting early um access folks get a chance to do it um or those one but i mean this this might be a good 10 years away for all we know this is not something we're sure when it's going to come out but yeah I don't don't put this in people's cars until it's like i, I know, agree i agree with you 100 percent, eric and dion if you want an example of what er e uh, eric is talking about just wait till enhanced summon comes out in version 10 and we start seeing accidents and bumps and all kinds of stuff happening in the parking lots that'll be your early indicator of <laughs> of what the ride sharing network is going to be like so yeah if you want a portent of what's going to happen just just pay attention to it and to that point trevor i do want to say this when enhanced summon comes out i want to say right away i just want to say this now while we have the chance to do it before it's in release in the coming months is i think early reports of any issues may not be the fault of the car the software the owner it may be other people other drivers doctors um, like, right that's that's what i think could be the case so yeah. let's fix my camera here. There we go. Uh, I've been fighting with that all night. All right. Next question comes from Paul. Uh, it's a two part question here. So I'm going to try and read it as best I can. He says, I took delivery of my uh, 2014 model S P 85 yesterday. And I have a couple of newbie questions. I'm hoping you can help with. Well, we're always welcome to happen mm -hmm. to help people. All right. First question. He says, I was lent a 2016 85 D service loaner while awaiting delivery. That's another story. Uh, the car had a brake hill hold feature and, and I, that I grew to love. My new car um, that, that was registered in September 2014 doesn't appear to have this feature. Is this something that I've missed in the settings or is there a uh, difference in the software and the hardware? Uh, that's the first part of the question. So let's answer that first before we get into the second one. Hill hold? Hill hold. I don't think it's, I don't think it's is there a feature? I, I, I mean, I've always turned it on my car. and it it's, not, it's not a software. It's either it, it just comes in your car. You can't yeah. turn it on or off. Your car either has it or doesn't. So just squeeze the brake a little harder and yeah, watch it, for the H in your display. So it could, it may be that that car, I mean, without knowing the specifics on Paul's car, um, ideally you have to press and hold firmly on the brake. Um, it may be that the 2016 loaner he had was more sensitive to it. Um, but Paul, if you, if you try to just press and hold down on the brake for a few seconds, it may require you to really kind of push down hard. Uh, if it doesn't turn on, then your car may actually not have it in the software. It may not be capable of doing I, it. I'm going to I'm gonna say one extra thing here, because I do remember there was a significant change that happened around the time that the uh, the D models came out, the dual motors. Uh, Tesla changed the brakes on those cars. Mm -hmm. um, they went from a purely hydraulic system to an electrically assisted system, or, or mostly electric uh, system. So that might be your answer right there, Trev. I think you're on if there could be some changes, yes, yeah. yeah, there could be some changes that are related to that, so um, y you never know. You might want to check with the t with one of the Tesla service people. They might be able to confirm that directly, but I, I have a feeling that could be related to that. Sounds right. Okay, uh, so Paul had a second question. I don't seem to have a referral code, either in my Tesla portal or the app. Is this because I bought a used inventory car? Um, no, you will get a referral code as soon as the ownership of the vehicle is switched to your account. So if you have the car in your account, you should have a referral code, especially if you bought the car directly from Tesla. That's my understanding. So you need to have purchased the car, and it needs to be have put into your Tesla account 
in order for a referral code to be visible. If you don't see it in your app, log into your uh, Tesla account online. Just go to tesla.com, click on Tesla account in the top, log into your account, and if you have a referral code, it'll be right there on your page. So look for that. If you still have questions, um, just send an email to Tesla and just say what the you know what the heck's going on. But everybody deserves a referral code, right, guys? Hell yeah! Right, yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Moving along here. Next question comes from Steve. He says, "Any guesses on how long it will take Tesla to do the FSD computer upgrades on all the hardware 2.5 cars where owners purchase the FSD option?" Uh, this is a question we get quite often. We've talked about this many times. Elon did state that they will not be doing FSD computer upgrades until at least sometime late in the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, a lot of it hinges on them getting most of the features complete uh, to support the hardware three computers. Right now they have a, you know, kind of the bare modicum of uh, features running on the cars that are in production right now since about March. They have the hardware three computer. But until it's really optimized and they have all the features locked down, they're not going to do the upgrades because there's no need to do it at this point. So if you bought FSD, just be patient. Your name's on the list. It'll happen when it happens. So that's the best I can give you at this particular time, T uh, Steve. Uh, let's see here. Two more questions. Next one comes from Harry. He says, when placing the Model 3 in park, do you routinely press the stock once for P, or do you press it until the parking brake icon appears? My wife and I both have a Model 3, and uh, we both park it both ways. Um, yes, that's what happens on a Model 3. When you press the, uh, the, the, the parking stock once, it just, you know, puts it in park. If you press and hold, it makes the uh, brake caliper squeeze harder. So it's more like a like more of an uh, like if you park on a hill like in San Francisco or something like that. Something you want to. Use. I don't think it matters either way. Um, just use whichever. I think. I would. I would make you. this one caveat. It depends on whether or not you're parking on a level area or mm -hmm. if there is an angle. Um, if you're, for example, in San Francisco and you're parking on a hill, you're going to want to use the parking brake. Otherwise, your uh, car's going to end up in the bay. Right. In 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 addition to uh, turning your wheel in the direction of the sidewalk. So, um, yeah, if you're if you're basically on like almost like a zero grade uh, pavement or parking lot or what have you, you're fine just using your standard brake. Uh, if but if it is on an incline, you're going to want to use your parking brake just as added security for your for your car. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last question of the evening comes from Carl. He says, any word on the CCS adapters so we can use Electrify America DC fast chargers? He's referring to the uh, the CCS adapter, they, they make them uh, available in Europe so that S and X owners um, can plug into CCS fast chargers to plug into their Type 2 connector. I've been long a proponent that uh, Tesla bring a version of that to America, North America, so that we don't have to pay the whatever it is, $600, $650 for that stupid Chatamo adapter. Uh, because Chatamo, of course, is limited to 50 kilowatt. That's Tesla's adapter is limited to 50 kilowatt. CCS, well, it's guy's the limit, right? Mm -hmm. Um so I really hope that they do this. Um, obviously, the, the adapter is going to be cheaper. It'll probably be around a couple hundred bucks US, so the sooner the better. I have a feeling, just like the Chatamo situation, that it's a matter of um, uh, testing and then testing and testing because even though the Chatamo adapter has been available on the Model 3 now for at least a, uh, a couple months now, uh, there have been a lot of reports of it not working on all kinds of chargers and adapters. So there's some firmware discrepancies that are happening. So I do believe um, it is going to happen in due time. It's just a matter of them testing and testing and testing. And once they feel that it's right, uh, then they will release it. Um, remember, the standards for charging is different in North America than it is in Europe. So if they certified it for Europe, doesn't mean they certified it here. So, Wait, it's not the same here as it is there? No, man. It's different. I mean, they don't measure things in like feet and inches over there? No, only you guys do that. <laughs> I feel so alone. <laughs> All right, well, that's the end of the show. Any parting thoughts, guys, or uh, you just want to get onto the plugs? Plug. The hair plug? Earplugs. Get earplugs. Is that available here? Earplugs, <laughs> hair plugs, whatever. All right, Ian, you go first. You're on screen. What would, What do you want to plug? Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Well, sometimes just wandering around the streets aimlessly, but <laughs> usually on Twitter. Um, at Ian Pavelko is the handle. You can find me Tesla Owners Online. As mentioned earlier, the handle is Mad Hungarian. And if you are looking for some cool Evolveware type stuff, you can go to my Teespring shop, um, Mad Hungarian's Evolveware on Teespring, T E E Spring.com, and pick yourself up uh, one of the Evolve shirts, uh, the weapon of mass adoption. Model 3, or our new, wait for it, Model Y wear. 
yes, a full selection, people. Model Y stuff. Get it now. Awesome. Why do I have to wait? Why? Why not? Because he said so. Okay. Eric, you're next. What do you want to plug? Where can people have a chat with you? Uh, just a quick reminder, again, if you if you somehow skipped the beginning of the show because you like fast-forwarding through advertisers, uh, my thoughts Please are don't. with everybody here in Florida who are going to be riding out uh, Hurricane Dorian in the coming days. Uh, so make sure everyone stays safe. We hope everyone who's a follower of the show and listens in uh, uh, makes it through the storm unscathed. Uh, person is more important than property that's for sure um you guys can find me on twitter the handle is ec fix it is ecfix and believe it or not i am about 20 ish uh followers away from cracking a thousand so i don't know Whoa. why i don't know what i deserve to do this but um, we'll help you tomorrow i know it's crazy so thanks so much for all my new followers i really appreciate it I hope my information is insightful entertaining whimsical whatever it is uh, a distraction from all the chaos around the world so thanks so much and uh, Trevor, I mean, you got, what, 80 things to plug? Uh, your roadsters and other stuff, so go ahead. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> well, you can find me. I'm very active on Twitter. The handle's Model3Owners. Don't forget, check out the forum at Model3Owners Club. Uh, see, I did it again, right? Tesla <laughs> Owners Online. <laughs> Either one works. Man, that's a hard habit to break after three and a half years, I'll tell you. Thanks, Chicago. Uh, my, uh, my, my handle there is Trev P. You can uh, look me up. You can follow me. You can tweet at me, whatever the heck you want. And, uh, oh, by the way, tomorrow is Friday? Yeah, tomorrow's Friday. Well, you'll hear this probably by then. Anyways, don't forget, it's our friend Earl's Frunk Puppy Friday. So uh, get out there and vote for your favorite uh, Frunk Puppies. Look, I'm wearing a shirt. Hey, Earl, love your shirt, man. Thanks for the it's sticker, that, by the way. It's on YouTube, but we'll figure that out. Yeah, exactly. And don't forget, once in a while, he runs a Frunk Kitty thing. So, yeah, and we're disqualified because we started the whole thing. So Nutmeg doesn't apply. So. Anyways, that's it for the show. Thanks for uh, tuning in, guys, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bonsoir tout le monde. I hope I have power next week. <laughs> we, we hope you do too, dude. <laughs> see you guys. Bye.